Hey y'all, how you doing? Hope you're having a good day. This video is continuing from the last video, and in this video, I'm actually going to start solving this equation here, which is uh, the equation for a driven damped harmonic oscillator, and it's an anharmonic model of the Lorentz model for an atom. And so x is the position of a point charge, and we assume we have a material made up of a large number of point charges. So I was saying in the last video we expand x in a perturbative series like this, and this constant lambda is between 0 or 1, so that the higher order terms get smaller and smaller and smaller. So what we do is we multiply the right-hand side of this equation here. I'm going to call this equation 1 to make things easy. So we multiply the right-hand side by lambda, and we plug in this x. And because of the condition that the coefficients in front of a variable, if that variable is on the left and the right side, those coefficients have to be equal. So, in other words, what I'm saying is, um, if we have an equation like this, little a times big A plus little b times big B plus little c times big C, and if that's equal to alpha times big A plus beta times big B plus gamma times big C, well then, that implies that a is equal to alpha, b is equal to beta, and c is equal to gamma. So we're going to use that fact um, to, we're going to be canceling all the lambdas, and so for the first order, for the linear uh, term, the equation we're going to get is this. That's the equation we're going to get. So, I already canceled all the lambdas. So, what we do next is we're going to assume that our incident electric field, E, is made up of only two frequencies. Okay, so there we just assumed that the incident electric field is made up of two frequencies and also we're gonna use this fact again the fact that I stated up here so I don't exactly know what it's called um, but I'm pretty sure it's correct and I'm just gonna call it theorem one because we're gonna use it again and whenever I use it I'm just gonna say according to theorem one even though I'm not gonna prove it Okay, so we're also going to assume that since the point charge X is driven harmonically along with E, it's going to have a similar exponential part. So we're going to write, we're going to assume a solution of the following. So we're going to assume that form where this thing in front of the exponential part is the thing we're most interested in, and that is the amplitude that the charge is driven at. And so I'm writing out the complex conjugates. I'm only going to do that probably for this video, but soon I'm going to stop doing that. I just want to write it out to convince you that... Or just so you can see that everything ends up working out, even if you don't explicitly write out the complex conjugate. Okay, so what we have to do is find the derivative of this and the second derivative of this.
Okay, so that's our first and second derivative. And then the next thing we do is plug everything back into this equation. But rather than plug in everything back into the equation, all I'm going to do is plug in one of these four terms back in the equation. Because I'm going to be using theorem 1, and it's going to work out the same way that the lambdas worked out. And since E has this form, all the exponential parts are going, I mean, the exponential parts are serving as the capital letters here. So everything in front of those exponential parts is going to have to equal each other. So we're going to get four equations out of this. So those four equations are going to look like this. Okay, so we get those four equations from that. And I think you can start to see a pattern. And, I mean, this is going to continue for future videos. I may continue to write everything out. <laughs> but there's always a complex conjugate part that looks the same. Except, I mean, you take the complex conjugate of all the, thing, all, of all the numbers that are complex. And you just change the sign on the i. And for any other frequencies... You just replace the whatever frequency with uh, the new frequency. So for the rest of this video, I'm only going to solve one of these equations. And then the solution is going to generalize to the other frequency. And the, it's going to generalize to the complex conjugate. Okay, so what we want to do is um, solve 2 for x1 naught. Okay, so that's what we get for x1 naught. Sorry, I got my signs confused because uh, I knew it was supposed to... This term right here is responsible for resonance. And I knew it had to work out that this omega naught had to be minus this other omega. Um, but that's the way it should look. So now what we do is recall that the... Polarization, the first order one, the linear polarization, is equal to epsilon naught times chi one times the electric field. But the polarization is also equal to the. Well, how do you put it? It's it's like the macroscopic version of all the little point charges oscillating. So if you have a large material made up of n atoms and all of them shift up by the same amount, then your whole polarization is just going to be n times, well, the, the little amount of uh, field they create. And in other words, that's written like this. X1. Okay, so here, we're since we have four equations, we could have four different polarizations, 
and plug in four different X's here. So right now I'm just going to do the one for X1 naught. So I would plug in, or I'm just going to do the one for X1. I'm going to plug in X1 into there. And remember, X1 is equal to this part plus that exponential part. Okay, so that is the first, the linear polarization at frequency 1. And notice that just to change x1 naught to x1, I mu multiply both sides of this equation here by uh, the exponential part, e to the negative i k1 x minus omega 1 t. Um, and that changes the x the things with not on them that changes that kind of gets rid of the not so that's why I changed this to e1 too that's why I changed this to e1 as well okay so now we have this so now we compare this part to this part up here and we can solve for chi 1 and we see that chi 1 is this So that is our linear susceptibility at the one frequency. And similarly, we can go through the same argument that we just did here, but except instead of x1 naught, we do 2 naught, and we also do the complex conjugates. And we're going to get the following susceptibilities. Okay, so that's all our susceptibilities, and I think you can easily do the polarizations also from that. And so I'm kind of doing something which I didn't really explicitly state. I'm sort of writing P, the linear polarization, as P1 plus uh, the complex conjugate of P1 plus P2, where the subscripts denote which frequency we're at plus P, the complex conjugate of P2. And, I mean, those are just equal to epsilon naught chi 1, 1 times the frequency, the electric field at 1, plus epsilon naught chi star 1, 1, And then I'm just equating each term on this side with its respective polarization. So that's how you solve for the linear susceptibility. And in the next video, I'm going to do the same thing, but for the second order susceptibility. So thanks for watching, and have a great day.